G'day pals, welcome back to a new video. Today we're going to be covering attack effects. Now attack effects are a topic that I have covered in some detail in previous videos but never done like a full proper tutorial on them uh, and on the, the kind of principles of them. There is some overlap in things like particle effects uh, but hopefully you'll be able to enjoy this like more compact reference. So uh, without further ado, let's get into it. So, attack effects, or in this case, sword effects, as that's what we're going to be focusing on in this video. Sword effects are a good reference because they contain a lot of the elements you'll find in different kinds of attacks. So hopefully, uh, even if you're doing like a gun or a hammer or something else, uh, you'll still find what you're looking for in this video. So what are attack effects? Attack effects are a subcategory of VFX, or visual effects, that are designed to communicate motion, and particularly impact. So we're talking about the transfer of energy and how we communicate the nature of what it is that's being transferred uh, to the viewer. Now, across different industries, including uh, anime, film, sports even, we talk about the components of the animations that require these kinds of effects similarly. We talk about things like wind up or start up, active or impact frames and recovery frames or follow through in a lot of these different industries, in combat sports, in uh, like golf or, you know, bat sports where you're, you know, swinging something. Uh, and in, of course, animation, anime, film, video games. These are common kind of like uh, areas or domains that overlap in this way. And whenever there's a kind of entertainment aspect to this and we have a chance to add some effects on there to make it more juicy, uh, this is where we see effects showing up. This is a really deep topic and it's one that is explored in a lot of depth in film and video games. There are people whose entire jobs are just to uh, design and implement these kinds of effects. And it's something that I see explored really awesomely <laughs> in anime, uh, particularly uh, Demon Slayer here, I think has a really, really awesome way of communicating the flow of energy and really uh, going beyond just communicating energy, but also communicating the material or elemental kind of style and source of that energy. Things like framing are obviously not something that you would necessarily see in most video games, particularly pixel art games, but it's worth going through very quickly um, the kinds of visual tools that are used here. So here we have like an anticipation frame. We're seeing something that will tell us where this is about to go, right? The sword is being unsheathed. Uh, here we've got like a, an instant kind of flashes and a thunder based attack and so this is supposed to happen very quickly. Uh, we're getting a shot here of that flash from a distance. This is like the smear, this is the impact frame. And then we're seeing like the results of the impact, right? This is kind of like the, the follow through. And so no matter from which industry or discipline you approach this process, the core foundations of visual communication are the same. This idea of communicating anticipation to the viewer, giving them something to uh, hold their breath over, and then communicating the motion. So actually having the, the action take place, right? And then providing more context around weight in the end frames. Okay, so how, what was the result of all of that motion that we just saw? Now, I want to pull this down into a more video game context, and one of my favorite video games for its effects is Super Smash Brothers. So here we're looking at Marth, and he's doing a really great sort of crescent slash here. So when we talk about effects, what are we actually referring to? Here, it's everything that's not the player model. So it's the dust that's being kicked up, it's this blue arc uh, that represents the path that the sword has moved in the last frame. So frame rate in any on-screen entertainment is very important because it relates to the fact that the, the images are actually a series of still images, right? The, the video that we're watching is really just one frame at a time. And when something happens very quickly, this uh, motion blur that we experience, uh, and even in real life, if you move your hand really quickly in front of your face, you'll experience some kind of motion blur. It's there to kind of let your brain see the path that an object has taken within the last two frames, right? Within a very short period of time, there's been a lot of motion happening. And so we kind of see all of the motion overlaid in one frame, okay? And in video games, uh, this is something that we kind of emphasize by having this trail last a bit longer. So let's look at a couple of animations here. 
from Smash Brothers. We've got some uh, attacks from Marth. We've got the anticipation frame, right? We've got the body in full, uh, full compression, basically. It's, it's ready to unload. Everything is as tight as it can be. There's maximum tension. Then we have the impact frame. Uh, so because this is a 3D model, the model actually is going to animate frame by frame from you know the back all the way through the impact and the follow through. In pixel art games, we're going to talk about this a little bit more, so we may not see this frame. But here the point of impact is recognized. We're seeing the smear of the blade, we're seeing a huge uh, flash with an impact as well, uh, and a little star that's kind of communicating um, essentially just like celebrating how big this hit was. We have some sparks flying around, we see uh, a kind of like air, like a sonic boom of air essentially being broken through, uh, and we're seeing the, the following of that trail, right, the, the continuation of that arc. This is obviously happening over time, uh, and now like a full extension of Mars pose, right? We've gone from being all the way back to all the way forward. As the uh, frame dissipates, you know, we see the dust kick up and, uh, you know, the trailing remaining particles sort of dissipate and uh, the attack ends. So there's a lot of effects going on here, but I want to particularly call out that in this animation, Marth lands at the end of the attack. And so the sense of follow through, the sense of continued motion of a, of a sword swing is not something that we're going to see uh, displayed here because the sword ends, right? It doesn't, it doesn't follow through, it goes into the ground and it stops. Now, for the purpose of this conversation, we can kind of think of two different kinds of attacks. We can think of blunt impact versus um, sort of sharp pointed impact. Blunt impact essentially stops at its target, right? It hits something and the damage is done over a great surface area and then all the motion stops. Okay, so think of a hammer striking an anvil or a punch you know, landing in someone's gut. There's a real kind of pause at the end because the motion is being stopped by its target. Whereas in the case of like a bullet or a sword, something that's that's uh, point of impact is much more um, fine and precise, there's much more chance that there's gonna be some sort of pass through on the impact. So the sword slashes all the way through its target or the bullet passes all the way through its target. And then we see some continuation. And in those cases, we have a different kind of responsibility of how we show the action. We wanna show kind of like this flourishing result of the impact rather than just stopping it dead uh, and having that thud we're trying to communicate the cut was so clean that the effects maybe take a little bit to actually uh, embody themselves and to, and to manifest and so it's important to think about the the kind of hit that's happening is it a slash is it a thud before we talk about communication of the actual uh, effects so here i'm going to show you another attack this one doesn't stop in the ground, this one continues going. This is kind of like an upwards spiral cut. So here we've got this jump frame, the dust kicks up because Marth jumps. Then we see the impact frame, and this green sort of splash is there to give us some indication of the direction of the motion. So because Smash Brothers is a physics-based fighting game, uh, knockback happens on every hit, and when there is uh, a directional knockback, it actually uh, is useful for us visually to see, okay, this attack is going in this direction. I anticipate that the character is going to fly in that direction after they've been hit. So there's some utility behind this. It's not just about showing, you know, that there was a big attack. It's also about showing the direction and the quality of that attack. If this was like a poison attack, you know, maybe we would want to show some poison effects. If it was fire based, we'd want to show some flames, uh, communicating information is just as important as communicating impact. So then we have the follow through. Uh, and here you can see it's really important because uh, particularly in low frame rate environments like pixel art, a lot has happened here. We've gone from a frame where Marth's sword and hand are extended back. If we pass straight through this frame in one go, on the next frame, the sword and the hand are still in the same place almost then where they started. They're still behind on the left hand side of the frame and so this smear going all the way around like this this spiral is really important in telling us what's happened visually right because it happens so quickly we're not seeing a frame where the sword is here and 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 here we're not seeing that right instead we're just seeing from here 
swish to here. And so the smear, this sword effect, is there to give us that visual context. It's to tell us what's happened. How have we gotten from back there to here? And most importantly, in the follow-up frames, because we didn't thud into the ground, we're actually gonna see some continued motion, right? Some cool down, some recovery frames that sell that rotational uh, motion. So I'm kind of telling you this in a lead up to a practical note about pixel art. So I'm gonna show you very quickly as an example, an attack animation that was done for Insignia in I think 2018. It's not my favorite attack animation. It's not even, I would say, a particularly uh, effective use of visual effects, but uh, it does showcase the constraints of the animation frames in pixel art animation, okay? So in this animation, we're seeing Armin, the main character, unsheath the sword, prepare to swing. We see him swing all the way through, and then we dedicate one, two, three frames. You know, you could even go further, four, five, six, seven, to recovery, okay? I would say probably from here on, we're putting the sword away. That's almost a different animation. But these frames here, we've got one, two frames of wind up, one frame of impact, and then one, two, three frames of recovery. The distribution of this is really important, right? Of the six frames of animation that there was, three of them were dedicated to what happened after the attack. So understanding kind of like what it is that you're trying to convey is going to change the distribution of where those frames are. Now, I've talked about this relationship between motion curves and animation frames in the past, but I'll go over it again just for your reference. So I like to think about all motion in uh, these kind of like graph kind of spaces. And in motion design and UI design, we have these curves that often show up when we're animating basic things. So, you know, when you click a button, when there's a fade transition in any kind of motion graphics, uh, these curves come up a lot. And they basically just represent something moving over time. There are different names for the curves that show up. So something that goes from point A to point B, like this is what we would call linear because the relationship is linear. If something happens in an increased rate over time, like this, we might call this exponential. Uh, you might call this an ease in curve because it takes time to ease into the animation. If it slows down over time, you might call this an ease out animation. And you can have both ease in and out, and then it looks like this. And so we're, we're looking at how fast something is moving over time. So it might, in this case, if you had an object, it might go slow, 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 fast, 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 slow, 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 slow. Now there are principles of animation that like Disney would cover that would say something like everything happens uh, in curves. Everything happens slow, fast to slow. That's kind of like a shortcut of the reality, which is more to do with um, like Newton's laws of physics, right? So basic physics is that in order to move something, you need to put energy behind it. And um, in like biomechanics, right? In like human terms, in order to make something move very quickly over time, you have to put lots of energy in a short amount of time, right? Nothing happens instantaneously. And so things tend to happen on curves because if you're, for example, throwing a punch, the punch doesn't just appear. You don't just teleport from point A to point B and then have recovery time. You've got a little bit of wind up time where your brain is sending signals to your arm. The arm is starting to, to move and it's accelerating over time as you add force and that force is being added to the previous force that was there over the previous amount of time, right? And then things accelerate and then you hit the thing and it stops or if you pass straight through, you know, it might slow down. Thinking about things in this way is I think really important when designing an attack because when you have only so many frames, this tells you where you should be dedicating those frames to. So an animated sword swing might look something like this, where we've got a few frames of lead up, a very great amount of motion over a very small amount of time, and then lots of frames where things are kind of winding down. This is like that second math animation that I showed you where the spiral cut ended in uh, you know, him pirouetting in the air. And so if we were to dedicate frames to this, uh, let's say we only had six frames to think about, right? We would take the space and we would divide it up into six. So then I would kind of like reshape this so that the frames are uh, capturing the dynamics of this curve correctly. It's kind of like photography where everywhere that you dedicate frames, 
in this setup will be technically accurate to the motion. But just like every photo is technically accurate to real life, not every photo is a good photo. And so in this case, where you dedicate your frames to will essentially help the animation look good when the game is paused or just in general in screenshots. Um, you want to be able to dedicate the right frames to the right motion. So don't have two frames, one where, for example, you see in this case, like we're seeing the start of the motion and then we're seeing the end of the motion, but we're never actually seeing the middle. We're never actually seeing that, that impact being captured in one frame. So I would, uh, this is like all very conceptual, but I would slide it to be sort of like, sort of like this, right? Where between like on this frame, right? In this amount of time, we're capturing all of the motion that's happening, right? All of this is being captured in this frame. And, uh, you know, maybe here I would capture the two frames of startup. So startup, startup, action, uh, and then recovery, recovery, recovery. And so that's kind of a model of what I was doing uh, in my animation here in Insignia. So same sort of thing, right? One, two, slash, one, two, three. So since we're on the topic of pixel art, let's go look at some pixel art examples from published games. Now this document here is kind of like a research document that I put together. Uh, I recommend that you do something like this yourself if you're making your own game. Uh, I put this together as essentially my pixel art VFX reference. Uh, not every game here is pixel art, but it's a way for me to study all the different kinds of games that I like, that I refer to when I'm making my game and think about uh, in more conscious terms, how they produce their visual effects. And there's a section down here in sort of like the bottom right where I'm looking at a couple of games. Uh, in this case, it's Gestalt, Steam and Cinder, as well as Blasphemous. And then earlier today, also Katana Zero, I had a look at some uh, hit effects from that game as well. So here you're seeing that difference that I was mentioning earlier between something like Smash Brothers, where we've got 3D models moving uh, in an interpolated way over time, where they can pause on the impact frame wherever that appears. And here in pixel art, where you can only draw your frames in advance and you don't know when that impact's going to be, right? So rather than try to stop the sword exactly where it should be in this arc, because the animation frame rate might be something like 12 frames per second, um, if the impact happens on one of those twelfths, then there's no sense in trying to break the, that one twelfth of a second down into the micro adjustments where the sword could be, you know, here or here or here or here or here or here. We just show, you know, anticipation frame and then the slash one twelfth later. Um, and we don't bother with that impact frame. So what do I like about this? I think this is a good couple of frames. I think we've got a really nice uh, hyper extension here showing like the full full potential of the body we're seeing a little bit of the uh of the effect appear and then here we've got uh, a very like bright red kind of like showing a lot of heat in this slash and as a game that's called you know gestalt steam and cinder you expect there to be some flame aspects to this and i think that they're being shown pretty well here now there's not a lot of like fire in this it's more of just like a blade slash We've got another frame here that I really love. I think this is an excellent frame um, where we're seeing more of that kind of material presence in the slash. This is probably more of like a fire-based attack. Uh, and we're sort of seeing that the slash is kind of being torn across space uh, in this frame. And we're seeing some sparks come out. We're seeing uh, trails. It, it just has a lot more life to it. And it's communicating something that I can understand visually. What's important is that as the viewer, when you're looking at these frames and particularly in motion, you can uh, take away something, right? You're actually understanding that, that that communication is happening and the information is being conveyed to you as you're watching it. So these are good examples. So another example here would be a game like Katana Zero. So in Katana Zero, um, we've got a lot of procedural effects going on with these attacks. Uh, part of this has to do with the game and the style behind it, so I won't go into too much detail there, but let's look at uh, all the different things going on. So we've got some dust particles at the start. We've got this nice anticipation frame where the character is clearly kind of preparing. It's got that that classic, you know, uh, samurai sword unsheath like we were seeing earlier with Demon Slayer. Okay, then we have this incredible impact frame where 
there's a lot going on, so let's break it down. We've got some blood particles here passing out of the subject that's being attacked. We've got this kind of like chromatic aberration, this like this stuff here, right? That's kind of like a smear slash neon wave. Uh, it's almost like a ghost particles. So like we're seeing this character silhouette repeated multiple, multiple, multiple times. You see that a lot in things like uh, Castlevania, but in this case, it's more of just like a blur. Uh, we're seeing uh, an impact. So this is kind of like, it feels like more of a stylistic, like a brush stroke to show like just a sheer impact, right? Uh, maybe it's doing the job of the Super Smash Brothers kind of like trajectory uh, communication. Uh, we've also got uh, this slash smear, right? So for the actual sword itself, we're seeing this go all the way through and around. And uh, a ridiculously large lens flare, which goes all the way through uh, also communicating that direction, right? That angle of incidence kind of thing. Now, uh, what do I think about this frame? I think it's a really effective frame. I think because samurai anime, in that culture of animation, there is a great emphasis on attacks happening essentially instantaneously. So a lot of anticipation and then an instant impact frame. Having that frame be as ridiculous as possible is kind of like uh, the name of the game. So stylistically, I think this really works. There's some stuff going on here, which I think is worth discussing very quickly where we're seeing a little bit of rotated pixel art. So I would say this slash here and this here and probably even the particle effects, maybe even the blood. In fact, almost every effect here has some rotation going on. So as in it was drawn one way and then in engine, it's being rotated. It's being rotated and then down sampled. So the pixels themselves are still square, but if we zoom out, you can tell to, to some extent that, that it wasn't designed at the angle that it's being shown. It's, it's kind of something that in modern pixel art games, you just see, it's not, it's not the prettiest thing to look at, but because like in this circumstance, we're really seeing this for a very short amount of time. I think it's kind of acceptable to do it this way. Um, I've personally become less of a purist over time when it comes to this kind of thing. I myself have rotated pixel art in my game. Typically, you know, there are times where it makes sense. If you can only really communicate something by rotating the pixel art, you should just do it. Players are not that picky about what they're seeing. And especially if it's happening quickly, it's not something that's detrimental to the game. Like for gameplay reasons, going in this exact angle being able to do that is more important than the alternative because the alternative would be something like locking the angles that the characters could move at to like 45 degree angles, right? Like maybe just this eight and maybe, you know, 45 degree angles just aren't that good for the gameplay in this case. You know, there's not a lot of height here. So having the character be able to launch upwards at an angle that's not necessarily, you know, 45 degrees it works well in this context. You want it to be sort of like arcing over this way. I think it makes obvious sense to, to employ rotation here. So moving on, what have we got? We've got, oh, really sick. Uh, again, another rotation, just like Marth, right? So the character's kind of like coming out of that rotation and you can see all of their, the clothes kind of billowing out and creating a bit more of like a, a flow. And we're seeing some of that arc kind of resolve into particles, right? Uh, that's just, again, part of that hand-drawn animation. We're seeing the uh, dust particles continue and progress. More of that smear kind of dispersing. And then we're seeing the blood kind of develop as well. As the frame continues, we're seeing more of those particles get sprayed out as the characters kind of like flying across the screen. Really awesome. And what I love here is actually this blood decal on the wall. This is a really interesting effect. I've never seen it before where um, because there is a wall here, and there's blood, you know, in the scene, grounding the scene with actual like fixed blood effects that uh, play out over the wall is uh, really, really technically impressive and really, really effective to look at. So I think this is an excellent kind of example. A lot of games have many different kinds of environments and contexts where you might see effects like this. And so 
uh, the constraints of you know making sure there's always a wall behind and um, you know applying this level of like visual flair and have the game still look good is something that makes the most sense here in Katana Zero's case because the game itself it's uh, design you know it's very hallway corridor based it's much like Mega Man in that sense uh, the style aspect of the game is a huge part of the game the character only has one weapon the marketing and the branding of this game its identity is really built around this one thing right and so uh, while the gameplay is diverse and there's a lot going on having this effect really really sell is uh, worth putting in this amount of effort but I wouldn't say for every game it's that appropriate so we do see other examples as well uh, blasphemous really cool example here we're seeing a lot of the similar stuff so the hit effects we've got the smears for the weapon um, we're also seeing um, other examples I'll, I'll note quickly although it's not really part of today's lesson um, special attacks where we're seeing more interesting particle effects um, communicate other aspects so here we've got this kind of like spherical effect that's going around the character we've got uh, like wind as the character descends down the wind kind of picks up we've got flashes of light um, explosive kind of orbs sparks flying uh, to really kind of sell you know that this attack is more than just a normal attack right there are things that you can do to kind of communicate hitboxes to communicate elemental affiliation, to communicate weight, gravity, uh, that you can do to kind of like, yeah, add a bit extra, right? And make things a bit more visually diverse. Personally, I really like the way that, um, and these are all hand drawn, that this circle shifts from white to blue to purple to like almost a red, that hue shifting, it's kind of does a good job of selling this kind of like ethereal magic quality to the attack. So before we get into the practical aspects of making an effect like this, um, a couple of things that I like to think about are the following questions. So, you know, what path is the blade taking? Are there any elemental or material properties that we want to communicate? Uh, are there any debris or particles on impact, you know, based on what we're hitting or the context in which uh, this attack is happening? Is this, a, is this an attack where there's going to be blood spraying in places or are we striking? Um, you know a wall is it made of wood what's happening as well as what direction the impact is moving along and most importantly though not written here um, how heavy is the object that's kind of a really important one so let's make our way to ace bright and see if we can come up with something cool okay pals we're back with uh, our practical part of the video basically what we're going to be doing here is just following through with our own interpretation of a hit effect we're going to be animating very, very briefly a rough attack animation, and we're going to apply some effects to that animation. So basically, uh, the first thing that I want to do is usually I bring in a reference to my character whenever I do any kind of new animation. For the purposes of today's conversation, I want to do an animation that's not a hard stop. I want to do one that slices through. So uh, I think maybe a standard like open-handed swing would be the easiest thing to go for. What I'll do most often is just establish like uh, a part of the frame dedicated to the floor, just so that I have got something here. Usually I'll actually create a bit more space for that. If we have the slash go through the floor for any particular reason, we've got a bit of buffer space for that. With an attack animation, you would have some kind of hitbox reference, right? You need to know like, where is this attack going to hit? So let's just define that very quickly. And for this purpose, I think it makes sense to probably have the main character a little bit more centered because I imagine some of this weapon, uh, some of this hitbox is gonna go behind the character at the end of the slash. So maybe it's even more like, like this. So I like to give a bit of clearance either side. This is not really representative as to how large I'd make a frame like this. I'm just giving myself lots of space. And then at the end of the animation, I can crop in uh, and make it tighter if I need to do that. So so now I would just go ahead and start thinking about the position of the sword on every frame. Keep these layers as copy layers so that if I add the frames, they get uh, copied across. Let's just make it like a really simple attack that goes like from uh, 
here to let's make it like one two three four five six maybe even seven frames i'll show you a little bit of a wind up active frames and some cooldown as well so let's go from here back a little bit and then maybe rest da, da, da. yep and then sometimes i go forward a little bit and then this would be the big slash the big sweep we want to cover as much of this hitbox as makes sense to do so something like this maybe keeping it really rough and then we've got here here and here so let's watch that back not bad i might even continue this a bit further a bit more of a deceleration and then add one more frame here and then do we need all of these frames at the start i'm gonna say yeah let's just get rid of the first two just for the sake of today's exercise ah, no i think i think we need at least one of them maybe just the first one we get rid of keep it seven frames And I think instead, I, I would love for the hand to kind of swing back up and around. I think that would be really cool. So rather than just stop here at the bottom, I want to bring this all the way up. And these will definitely change. All of what we're doing right now will change as we're actually like prototyping it out. Like there's no skeleton here, so we can't really see whether it makes anatomical sense. So I'm going to try to flesh out where I want this slash to be over the multiple frames that it exists for. So just trying to think about, okay, you know, we've got some dissipation happening here. We've got less of it over the subsequent frames. Maybe on the last frame, we're gonna keep some of this around. And basically what I'm thinking about when I'm doing this is I'm trying to convey to the player the way that the blade is passing through the air. As we were talking about earlier, like is it a flame attack is it a whip kind of attack is it like really sharp and, and quick or is it more heavy does it like cut through the air efficiently or is it like quite aerodynamically kind of like cumbersome so in this instance i think something more simple would be uh the right way to go about it maybe we give it though a little bit of like a lightning effect or something elemental pretty good there is something that I think we're missing here, which is that uh, we don't really have a lot of emphasis on the point of kind of like maximum slash. So here I'm going to thicken this out a little bit. And my goal here is to really have this arc appear as like algorithmically sound as possible, like it was created with like a Bezier curve. So uh, there are a few ways to, to do this. If, if you're really, really new to this process, and you want a bit of a shortcut, what you can do is grab yourself a circle, right? And then just draw that circle, change your color to say like a red or a completely different color. And then you can kind of like draw like a second circle inside of that, you know, maybe something more like, like this, and then erase the first one. And what you're left with is something that feels like it's got a consistency in how that weight changes right like we've got like you know one pixel here two pixels three pixels four pixels five you know it's actually getting thicker in a way that is smooth and then it gets thinner again in a way that's also smooth this is kind of trying to create a process that automatically gives you that smoothness or that that sense of consistency over time i don't think this is like the most effective process it's really good for beginners because it gives you something that's good early but i would say uh, eventually you're going to think about these things in more specific terms you know if you've got hitboxes you want to match the shape of the hitbox a little bit more so you know this isn't necessarily an oval it's got a little bit of a bias towards the bottom end less on the top so eventually you're probably going to want to draw these things yourself so what i like is there's kind of two things right there's there's the actual motion so that the tip of the sword here, hypothetically sword, whatever it is, we want to show that that has moved. Okay. And so the idea is that, you know, over time, the movement over time, it's kind of like where here, we're doing all of this motion and then we're doing a little bit more and a little bit more and we're stopping, right? So it's 
kind of like that in like the distance that the head of the sword moves over time. So like this moves a little bit and then it moves a lot. And then it moves from here to here. It's like a little bit more, right? This distance here is represented here. And then it moves a little bit more and then basically nothing. So that's kind of how I'm representing that. And you could, you could draw this statically as like a curve, right? It's like that ease in out curve I was representing. So there's that. And then there is also kind of like uh, showing you persistently the area that this sword has covered for the purposes of hitboxes and stuff like that. And what I like to do then is you can see here, I've kind of kept some of the shape lingering around on subsequent frames, right? It's like the air that has passed through is still kind of playing catch up with the sword. So the swords pass through this area and I actually like to, I like to billow this out a little bit too. So it actually kind of gets a bit bigger over time. Uh, like the air is kind of like expanding outwards because it's got this kind of radial aspect to it, right? We, we're sweeping around. And so there's like this almost um, centripetal forces that are like pushing outwards. So I like to expand as we go a little bit. And, uh, and yeah, so that it's like, it's like the air is catching up in a way that's representing or ghosting that original frame lagging slowly, still following the, the trajectory of uh, the, the edge of the sword or the, the tip of the sword, but sort of slowing down and radiating outwards at the same time. That's the way that I like to think about it. So here we can kind of just still trace this out a little bit. These particles, I'm just going to make them sort of continue forward a little bit. And even like in this instance here, I sometimes try to keep some of the body, the weight of it here, the mass, just like representing like a bit more clearly here. Uh, I'm only really drawing this in one tone so far. So eventually we're going to have to fill this out a little more clearly, but this kind of gives me like a rough estimate of like what's happening. And you can see here, like frame to frame, this line here, I'm sort of proceeding clockwise you know, in the wake of the sword itself. So it gives your eye something to track and gives you that sense of, oh, there's some rotation here. There's some like uh, fizzling out or persistence of motion as the inertia uh, is like proceeding forward. So let's have a look. That's pretty good. So trying to show you know, on frame one, the entire thing, this is exactly what's happened. On frame two, we're dissipating, we're, we're thinning the shape out, right? So there's less of it, but we're still trying to, trying to draw this like sense of rotational motion that's being left behind. Let's see if we can compare that to some of our other frames from earlier. Let's see if any of that is consistent. So yep, here we've got Marth. Look at the, the weight of this, look how thick the uh, blade uh, reflection is or the blade effect and then as it sweeps over you can see that we're still we still have this volume that's thinning right that still traces that shape but it's it's less voluminous over time so that's kind of what we're trying to do here but we've got a bit more of a more of an opportunity to be creative with this because this isn't a procedural effect right we're doing it by hand and so i think in a way we actually have the chance to do some more interesting stuff here, like having these kind of like wisps of air, these like tears passing through the path of the blade, I think is kind of even more interesting, so. But I also think that the color in that was really cool. So I, I almost want to keep some of it. Maybe we do go for lightning. Lightning tends to be very jagged. So maybe it's more of like a thundercloud that we're uh, attacking with. So something more like air based than strictly speaking lightning based. Maybe that's kind of cool. Before I go too deep into this thing, let's add a silhouette of a body that we can follow along here because it's not very good practice to just draw the, the blade effect uh, over, the, over the entire time. It's not, it's not how you would do it. Instead, what you would do is you would have this base, you have a character here, you would probably just draw the arm. Maybe this is, if this is the tip of the sword, maybe it's worth sort of drawing that out. Uh, in fact, let's just start with the character and I like to silhouette these things out first Let's push the head forward so that we've got some extension on the arm here and then bring this 
out. I like to bring the arm up as well. Maybe we could do some more interesting stuff here by bringing these legs more this way. Bringing this knee kind of up a little more. This more into like a forward spring. And again, for the sake of today, let's keep this mostly still. And let's see if we can trace this blade. Next frame. And then here, we're gonna have this uh, step forward. So I think it might make the most sense to have the character in front of the blade, just for this sake. It's really hard with rotation in 2D because we've got layers, right? But uh, the sword is going from in front to behind or from behind to in front. And so where the layering of the weapon before the attack and after the attack will be on different layers. So you can either split it out into two layers or kind of cheat it. And just uh, in this case, like we're just sort of like erasing the parts that would make that not work. Just bringing the character in front all the time. So uh, where were we? We had this frame and then head down. Maybe we're looking up. Don't lose sight of the target. Maybe, maybe a little bit of a point to that toe. We could just kind of rotate this a little bit on this frame. I think what I'll do is I'll animate the character moving in space. Typically, you wouldn't do that because for a sprite sheet, you would move the character in the engine. But because we don't have an engine here, we're just in a sprite. I want you to see kind of the effects of all of these things as they would be in the engine anyway. So I'm going to move the sprite forward to give that a bit more of a sense of, of motion. But yeah, you wouldn't necessarily do this. And I think this leg could be a little more out. It's looking good. You can speed this up a little bit. And now we have a bit more of a reference for where the sword should be. So let's, uh, let's draw the sword out. That looks good. So now we're in a pretty good spot where we've got a really good sense of like what the character's doing. We know anatomically that the sword is in a, is following a path that feels like it makes sense. And we've captured uh, the motion of the attack. So we've got a pretty good idea about what's happening now. Maybe I'll bring these back a little bit just to create a bit more of a sense of drastic motion. From here, what do I want to do? I want to see if I can build out a bit more of the sense of the, the sword's path and communicate that a little bit more effectively. So from here, I'm looking at the distance between the frames. So what do I show on each frame? Uh, what's on this frame and what's on this frame and do those things match up? So let's come over here and erase this a little bit. So I can turn on onion skinning over here to uh, see that a little bit more clearly. So this shows me the previous and next frame and you can customize how many frames you actually wanna see by dragging these little um, kind of angles uh, either side of those frame uh, icons. So here we can just see a little bit better where that sword has been. And I'm actually gonna turn off the future frames and just think about what frames we've left behind. So on this frame, you know, when I look at this, I'm now thinking, okay, as a, as a system of particles, as a piece of visual communication that my eye is tracking, is this frame where we see nothing, is that telling my eye enough about what's happened in this region? To me, I think no, I think we wanna see a little bit more. So we've gone from here to here to something maybe over here I wanna still see behind. So that we're seeing the trail sort of slide forward as well. We're seeing that motion continue on. And basically what I like to do is kind of populate this more down, you know, the end of the blade. So the sword was here the longest time ago. And so it has the least amount of visual, uh, you know, presence. You can see here, like we've got something here visually, and then we've got something that is, if we take it all, look at all of this mass on this frame, we've got less of that mass, but we don't have much of a sense of direction, right? 
this this could be stuff from here that's moved this way or it could be stuff from here that's moved that way so on the next frame i want to show that you know some of this is still left over and it's moving in this direction right it's moving this way so we can even kind of keep one more pixel around at the end there if we're happy to do that now this sense of breaking things up into very small particles like this works for what i'm trying to do where it's more like cloud uh, based it's less of a clean attack and has a bit more of material volume to it um, you may not have this opportunity to do this if you were doing something more clean like a swift like samurai cut so same thing over here i want to continue some of this particles and i want to just do that everywhere right anywhere that i see some volume i want to continue that forward and just show its dissipation and you can see there that makes it really easy to track now as i watch this i think is that right so we've got some you know a frame here we've got some movement forward and then oh this just stops right this frame here where the front of the particle is just the same that doesn't feel right to me so i'd actually continue this forward a little bit so we've got this we've got this we've got this maybe we take this away like it's a bit, a bit simpler nice And I think even maybe like we could show a little bit more of this stuff, maybe one extra particle and where, how it's dissipating as well. Nice. Now at this stage, we haven't put a lot of thought into what these particles are made of. They're, at the moment, they're just things that are in the air that are sort of traveling in the general direction of the blade. But if we want to give them some more character, we want to think about what they are. Are they wisps of cloud? Are they air particles? So one thing I might think about is, you know, maybe they get caught up in the wind. If they're very light, they might sort of wisp away and spiral away. So on this frame here, we might have some volume that's sort of coming up against the ground and rotating out, creating a bit of rotation there. So let's see if we can do that. And this is particularly because we're doing something that's more air-based, right, in this context. You wouldn't necessarily do this exact effect, um, but just giving you an idea about what I think about when I'm doing effects like this. We go a little bit more, one more extra particle. And honestly, I should have done it on a new layer. We should see that stuff maybe a frame before. So let's take it back a frame and move it forward here. That's got a nice bit of rotation to it. And that's something that maybe we could see passing over the entire sword. So if we had a lot of time to do this, maybe we'd have lots of little particles following those same kind of paths of motion, you know, whipping out from the sword itself. Yeah. And maybe especially at the end here, this, this place here, we would see maybe like a huge kick up of dust. And dust tends to increase in volume over time. If you want to make something kind of billow and cloud up, you have a lot of condensed dust on the first frame. And then on the next frame, it kind of like billows out. And then as it dissipates, it thins out. It doesn't get smaller in the amount of space that it takes up. It just thins out until it's not there anymore. So in this case, I'm trying to make these, these volumes bigger, but thinner and slowing them down kind of exponentially as well. So they start really, really fast and then they sort of slow down into more of a drift. I should mention to you, like I'm doing this from a place of experience, right? And so I'm kind of able to remember the directions that things were moving in. I'm able to think about like without watching it back every time I'm able to think about how I expect these particles to behave frame by frame but as you're learning this stuff you'll find that that process is not particularly easy to follow right you, you'll take time before you have that intuition about like where things need to be frame to frame uh, if you really want to practice this stuff I would say start with something much simpler than this start with just like a, a single ball bouncing around the scene that will help you kind of think about how things move over time so for me this is kind of like i'm watching lots of balls bounce 
I'm just thinking about lots of things in motion and I probably won't get it right, but um, this allows me to, that's pretty good. This allows me to think about things, to put something on the canvas that is moving. And then I'm using my judgment, my critical eye to then make adjustments to that thing. If you just spend all of your time going frame one, finished, frame two, finished, frame three, finished. And then at the end go, oh no, it doesn't work. You'll never build that sense of judgment of like what looks good. So instead I do the whole thing really quickly in one sweep, one prototype pass. And then I can say, okay, what do I like about this? What don't I like? Now, one other thing that I did here that I haven't kind of explained uh, that makes this look really good really quickly is when you're working with a particle system, there is this concept of what's called pre-baking the particle system. That means starting the system at a point in time that's not zero, okay? So because we had all this motion pass through, right, in one, in one go, I started this system, this particle system, kind of like a few frames ahead of where it would actually be. Like if the start of this, if we were to go back in time, if you rewind from here, back, 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 the previous frame would be something that was like here, right? That had, uh, that where this was further back, but not completely gone, right? But what I did was I started like halfway through to kind of show you this sense of like, well, the sword moved so quickly, right? The sword was from here to here. And so this dust that kicked up had to get from there to here in that time almost it's almost like respecting the speed of the weapon that created that dust kicking up so it's almost like you know you look at an explosion you know from like an atomic bomb and the amount of dust that kicks up on like the first instant is like huge because there's so much energy that it sort of like gets from the ground to up in the air instantly so i'm trying to cr kind of create that pre-baking uh, but i think we probably could have had a little bit more here so maybe i'll just do some sort of like a spark that shows sort of that lots of stuff is happening. Yeah, maybe just a bit of a hint that it's gonna curl around here. That's looking really nice. I think one of the things that I'd like to see is the volume of the blade a little bit more. So the, the blade here goes all the way down to here. And so as this thing passes through, you know, there's theoretically a blade all through this space as well. And we don't have any reference to that yet. So it might be nice to, uh, on this frame, here on a new layer. Let's just trace where we think the blade will have gone. And I'm gonna use a blue for this. And I'm just gonna sort of trace where I think, you know, thinking about this thickness, going all the way through to where the blade is now. And, you know, I'm taking into account that this is not, you know, the character lives in a 3D world, things like foreshortening, you know, this arm is going behind and away from the body. So, the blade's thickness in terms of pixels would be flatter at the end because we've gone from being straight up to more facing the camera or away from the camera. So this can be a bit thinner, but just trying to make sure that it's a smooth transition, right? These curves are, are feel smooth, looks good to me. Uh, as you were seeing in the Smash Brothers examples, you know, like the, the blades, the blue of the blade was kind of more blue towards the end. So you could sort of pretend that there's a bit more, uh, you know, concentration closer down the blade. Now, terribly unfinished, right? Like all of this stuff here that we're seeing, it's very uh, messy. There's lots of stray pixels going around. As I clean this up, and I might spend a couple of hours doing this, right? Like today's lesson is just a lesson, but I would try to make sure that these shapes were visually constructed in a way that made obvious sense of, again, are they following the path? Are they communicating some kind of material or elemental affiliation? Are they doing their job in actually tracing out what I'm trying to show them? So this, I guess, phase of the lesson is to really just make sure that you're being careful, right? That you're being critical about all of the parts of the effect. You know, we place down a lot of pixels very quickly, but we still need to go through the process of actually making sure that we've refined those pixels, right? Otherwise it's going to look noisy and messy, which it does currently. I'm not advocating for this as a style is what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to uh, 
make sure that you are remaining accountable for the pixels that you place and trying to keep them nice and clean. Okay, now should we have a subject? I'm going to take an old animation of Armin dying and uh, use that one. And if you want to emulate a little bit of hit stop here, we could probably make this frame a little longer. So let's think about effects a little bit more. Uh, I did like the idea that there was some kind of lightning aspect to this. So let's see if we can take the sword, make it a little grayer so that we've got a little bit more of a ceiling on which to build the lightning effect. And then on a new layer, an impact frame, so I want to show like a lot of energy blasting out the back of the attack point. And maybe we make, won't make these travel so much as just disappear thin out so they can cast outwards but also just get thinner over time and I like to just try things there's no real rules here about any of this stuff so feel free to just like play around and see what comes out you might find something that represents some motion or energy in a way that you've never seen before but that looks really good uh, and you won't really get a good sense of what does work and what doesn't if you don't put the time into experimenting anyway. I think there's a, a real practical aspect to animation that uh, it's not something you can just do by watching other people do it or, uh, or you know, reading theory. Like, you have to kind of do a little bit of prac as well. A lot of prac. Yeah, see, that, that works a lot better for me. Seeing the blast extend out but not travel. It's, it's, it's the, the head is traveling out, but the entire thing is thinning. That feels a lot better. I think it represents, it feels more like light and less like a particle in this way. And that's kind of what I want, like a flash. So I learned something just now. Maybe we even return some of it back to the source. That could be interesting. Cool. So from here, I would obviously go and refine that. There's one more layer to this that I'd like to experiment with. And that's kind of like a big lightning strike. And I think lightning is the same where you, you it's, it's better to dissipate than to travel. And you would have like a little bit of travel, but uh, it's mostly flashing in one spot than it is uh, you know, doing anything else. And I think you could even take some of these and, and skip a frame. Yeah, that feels like lightning for sure. It's like, it's there and then it's gone and then it's there again. And maybe it's progressed further forward in time. And maybe we make these a bit more yellow just to sell the lightning aspect to it. Pretty cool, <laughs> pretty cool. I think in this case, maybe the black flash is like a little much. We can keep it on every frame if we want, just so we can watch it happen. And there's, of course, a phase here where we really need to stop and think about, like, the which elements we think are uh, too loud, too quiet, play around with this stuff, definitely iterate through it. So, like, I think this flash probably needs a color associated with it. It's, it's too bright right now. So maybe on this frame it's okay, but then, like, on the subsequent frames we could make it a bit more, like, yellow, and then we could, we could hue shift it out into something a bit more darker. You know, and maybe the lightning's a bit much. Uh, maybe like this flash is, is a little too much. Like I would definitely go through this process and then start to work things back. Maybe all of this could be a bit more transparent, you know, maybe more like half opacity. Or I could even start to, to break it up. So like uh, there's this, which is uh, like fully opaque. And then on this frame, you know, you could take just this kind of like whip edge here. Keep that on its own layer and then make the rest of this more transparent. So like, and then 
this now is just the particle layer and we can make that a lot thinner. Yeah. Nice. So now like the lightning goes a lot further, right? The lightning feels like it's doing a lot more heavy lifting and preserving the trail. The like wind break is less emphasized. And I would do that everywhere. I would even, you know, this, see if I can make that a little less opaque. Uh, maybe it's something that becomes less opaque over time, you know, like we were saying earlier. So we've got more of a... Yeah. Now let's break it down really quickly again. So first frame, we have a, a wind up. Second frame, a little more anticipation. Third frame, we've got the entire impact. Uh, this is kind of like a, the max frame, right? We've got the full extension of the body. We've got the sword coming all the way through. Next frame, we go into recovery frames. So we've got one, two, three. If this was like a player animation, maybe we would start to recover back to a neutral pose by frame, you know, frame six. So we've got one, two, three. Maybe here you would start bringing the sword back in if you wanted to sheath afterwards or just go back to a neutral pose while holding the sword. And, you know, as we go through, we just resolve all of those particles, right? Try to make things uh, kind of pass through space and time in a way that feels like it is a natural progression of the materials that the thing is made of. Again, like I said, it's, it's quite easy to fill out a frame with pixels when you're doing it in this way with like a larger brush size keeping things nice and uh, and loose, but eventually you do have to bring it down into a more realistic space. Something that feels like, you know, this uh, isn't overwhelming my eyes. I can actually see what's happening. I would say right now, maybe the dust is probably still too loud by like half. So like I'm seeing more of this. My eye is, is tracking this a little bit more than it's tracking what's over here. So maybe I would drop this layer down by half again. Maybe that's a bit easier to follow now. And on this frame, you know, maybe we bring this up again. So we take this and we bring it all the way back up. Right, we're emphasizing, don't look over to the left, look over to the right. And I'm just dropping the opacity for the sake of my convenience, but you can also do like palette swapping too, right? I could have used a darker color here. Instead of bringing this down visually, I could have replaced the color with a darker color. Same thing here. Could Instead of making it less opaque, we could just make it darker. Cool. So, there you go. That's hit effects. If you felt like you learned something, then uh, let me know in the comments below. I'm always really happy when people come to my stream and say, Hey, uh, you've got me into pixel art and I'm starting to make a game. It's, uh, it's really motivating to hear that kind of stuff. So definitely, if you feel it and you think that you might be annoying me by saying so, you're not annoying me. I love hearing it. Uh, and if you have any comments, criticisms, or things that you'd like to see in future videos, definitely let me know as well. I'm really, really interested in hearing what in my catalog of videos I've kind of missed out on that you guys are still wanting to see that I've kind of skipped over or maybe haven't gone into enough detail on. Uh, this is in details, so the details part is uh, something that I put a lot of stock into. All right, thanks pals. It's been a little while since I made one of these lecture slash tutorial style videos, so I enjoyed making it and I hope you did too. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Hey pal, thanks for watching and thanks most especially to the patrons and Twitch subs who support this channel and my game dev project Insignia. To find out more, click the links in the description below. And uh, if you like this video, tell YouTube by clicking the like button and then YouTube will tell me and then I'll make more videos. That's nice. Thanks again and uh, until next time.